Our next speaker, Brother, Brother Johnny Oxendine, will be speaking on the subject of what is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Johnny is a native of Virginia. He's been living for quite some time in California. He's been preaching for the San Mateo California congregation for 16 years. Man, it doesn't seem like that long. <laughs> it probably does to them. Uh, married 28 years to the fourth <laughs> family, John Howard. But now you can get back at me. I've been here longer than you've been there. So he has a daughter, Leslie. Married to Jeremy Hicks and living in San Mateo, and a son Andrew still in the home somewhat and attending school, College of San Mateo. He graduated with a business degree out of the University of North Carolina system. He has preached in meetings in California, Texas, Nevada, Florida, and is presently co-directing the English lectures. And um, we're very pleased to know his work, to count him as a friend, to know of his determination to do what is right as the Bible defines the right. Uh, we've had a good association in, in working in some of these uh, together. Hope we will continue to do so. Uh, I'm thinking, Brother Dub, of something that happened when Brother Noah Hackworth, his father-in-law, was at San Mateo. And I believe you were being introduced by the infamous Eddie Whitten. Is that correct? Or it was after the sermon, wasn't it? And he wanted to... to uh, to congratulate Dub on doing such a, a great job, but he said you have done better than what we expected you would do. <laughs> of course, he meant to say you exceeded our expectations. Well, the vote's still out on him, so we'll have to wait and see now. <laughs> would you come and see? Yeah, I understand. But I said the infamous Eddie Whitten. So, uh, Johnny, please come speak to us on this great subject. Well, as you probably already know, David's often wrong about something. I was not born in Virginia. I was born in North Carolina, but that's okay. I know. You just let it go. Just let it go. <laughs> and um, first thing I want to say is how much I appreciate the congregation here, especially the, the elders and, of course, uh, David, and the work that you do, one of the things I noticed when I came in last night was uh, the numbers on the uh, board here for attendance, the Bible class, the AM, PM worship, and the Wednesday night class, uh, how consistent the numbers were. And I think that that's uh, a tribute to the work that you do here, to uh, impart to the membership the importance of attendance. And uh, we're trying to do the same thing in San Mateo. All the congregations should do that. You know, you look in a lot of places by the time the p.m. worship or the afternoon worship. A lot of times you only have half the people or 25% of the people, and sometimes on Wednesday night you don't even have that many. So people need to understand the importance of uh, attendance, Hebrews 10.25. <clears throat> now, Ken Chumley, I, I just have to mention this. I, I wasn't going to mention this. I wasn't going to say anything about it. And uh, even though he said the prayer, it was a very nice prayer, uh, Ken Chumley, when he uh, came out to San Mateo, I'm, I'm not really, should I say this? Uh, he came out, let just let it go, just let it go. You know, Ken Chumley came out there, and of course, you come out to California, it's beautiful out there, of course. Uh, you come up the coast, Monterey, and all those places, and you come to San Francisco, and people like to, uh, you know, the Golden Gate Bridge, and uh, sourdough bread, and, you know, all these sort of things. And, but, you know, Chumley wanted to get a look at our colorful citizen, citizenry out there, and uh, he wanted to know where, where part of that citizenry, uh, citizenry was. He said, he said, some of the groups in San Francisco I haven't seen yet. So we, we came around and uh, uh, eventually saw a group prancing around, had a flag and everything, and, and he felt much better. It was like rice -a -roni, you know, a San Francisco treat for him. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I want to get David really quickly also before I get to this, because David comes around and he, he he gives out these topics, and, and two years ago I had come to the table by John uh, Mark Hicks. And, of course, that was a very odd book because here, here was a person supposed to be educated, highly educated, supposedly, Ph.D. and all, and, 
that he seemed to think that the Lord's Supper was something that uh, was not really uh, reverent, something that wasn't really important. And he came to the notion, of course, after the institution of the Lord's Supper, by the time you get to Luke 24, that he had, that was the, for him the establishment of the church and the first Easter and, and just about everything else. He, I don't know where David gets these different ideas. And so today I have one, the question of what is the Church of Latter-day Saints. And of all the groups of, that have been presented so far and some that will follow, of all of them, I can't think of one that you, you think of these different groups that, that claim to have a relationship to God and that, that here is one that is absolutely uh, fantastical in, in the way that it began. Uh, most of them so far have some sort of, you can see the evolution of thought as it apostatizes, as it moves away from truth. Some of these, uh, the Lutherans, of course, you can see where they supposedly think they, they are in relationship to the Bible. And, of course, some of the early ones, the Christian church, and, and later with Michael, the disciples of Christ. But here is one where when we look at this group of people, millions and millions of people, over 6 million people in the United States are part of this group. They continue to add to it. They continue to have converts. You, you have to look at it closely. You have to look at it and see what is it about this group of people uh, that has allowed it to be successful? What is it about this group of people where you can travel around the world? You can go to Utah. You can see these, these majestic temples uh, with spires of gold. What, what is it exactly that draws these people uh, to this system of belief? What, what makes them interested in this, you go, you go back and look at the question. We have to, we have to look at it seriously. We have to pose the question, uh, attempt to answer: Who are these people? Who are the Mormons? How did they come into being? You know, what is it they believe, and how do we put those aside? The things that we see in the Bible, which, to a nominal degree, they say they believe with with certain, uh, you know, appendages to it. And so we have, to, we have to investigate this. We have to give it serious thought, just like John did with the Lutherans. So anytime you, you're looking at another religious group, religious organization, you have to seriously look at uh, their system, their organization, their, what their, system, their foundation of belief, all these things. You want to be objective. You don't want anything to cloud or obscure uh, or taint the outcome of the findings of an investigation of a group like that. So what is it that makes this group tick? What are the validity of, of their claims? What are the accuracy of their statements? You have to look at these things. And that's what we want to try to do a little bit today. You know, as John said, prove all things. You know, to see whether those things that are said are so. And so we want to look at this a little bit. We want to look, look at some of the things that, that uh, Smith said. We want to look at some of their documents. We want to look at <clears throat> some of their uh, comments with relationship to the Bible and see who are the Latter-day Saints? Who are the Mormons? <clears throat> and so <clears throat> chapter in the book that says Genesis or Joseph Smith, not the book of Genesis, but just beginnings, the beginnings of the church. And John uh, covered that really well this morning. I don't want to go over uh, all of that, but the beginnings, or is it Joseph Smith? And here, uh, the New Testament, as was said earlier, more than clear on the establishment of the church, the beginning of the church, the head, the organization, the establishment of the Lord's church, Jesus in Matthew 16. He will build his church. It will be his church. He will be the head of the church. He has all authority of the church. He is the savior of the church, Ephesians 5, 23. So the scriptures are clear on these points. That there is only one church, that the church is the body of Christ. It came into existence the day of Pentecost. Acts chapter 2. All of these things are not only uh, documented in the scriptures, but you can look at how they unfold as, as a result of, of earlier Old Testament prophetic utterances. You can look at the book of Daniel, you can look at the book of Joel, and you can see a consistency throughout the scriptures. And then after you, you do that, you, you ask yourself, how could anyone really attempt to establish an organization, call it a church, using the Lord's name? And a lot of people have tried in vain, but there has not been one, at least I'm going to say it because this is my lesson, <laughs> as outlandish, as ridiculous, as, as foolish 
as the Church of Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints. Now, I know there are a lot of odd religious organizations, but to have one built out so enormously in this country and with the missions in, in various other parts of the world, to have come into existence as a result of what seems to be a very unstable person. I mean, you look at this person, Joseph Smith, Jr., and you can focus on him, and by focusing on him, you can say, who is this man who started this organization? What is it that, that was, is it about him that has caused this uh, religious um, ferocity in a certain sense? You have people coming to the doors, the houses in your neighborhood. They're young. They have the little uh, you know, elder on there. They're sincere. The people actually believe in something. Now, many of their documents, of course, are contradictory, and we'll look at some of those in a, in a moment. But they, they really do believe in this organization. And so when we look at this person, Joseph Smith, who is this man? He was born, it, it, information about him is voluminous on, a, on the internet. You can look at it in books all over the place. So much of the information, of course, is, is, uh, is in the book. Born December 23rd, 1805 in Vermont. Family was, was poor, had early injuries, was on crutches. Family moved around quite a bit, more than a dozen times in, in 10 years. Yet one of the things that was a characteristic of the family was oddness. The people who, who who knew them thought that these are odd people. As a matter of fact, his own father-in-law said he became acquainted with Joseph Smith Jr. in November 1825. He's 20 years old. He was at the time in the employ of a set of men who were called money diggers. His occupation was that of seeing or pretending to see by means of a stone placed in his hat and his hat closed over his face. In this way, he pretended to discover minerals in hidden treasures. Now that's odd all in and of itself. But this is also the way that the Latter-day Saints began. Now I want you to, I want you to look at, at what we have in the New Testament scriptures, what we have in the Old Testament actually, when the prophecies about Jesus Christ and, and the fulfillment thereof. And then in the New Testament, we see in the gospel, we see the life of Christ, we see who he is, we see what he does, and we see the, the epistles writing about Jesus Christ and, and, and all of this information. And, and we see a man, uh, a man and, a, and the Son of God consistently throughout who brings this message of, of peace, of salvation, forgiveness of sins. And then we look at the man who starts this Mormon organization. And he is a man who, it, the only way you can really honestly describe it is he's a scam artist. I mean, you, can, you, you have to say he's a scammer. I want, I want to ask you, who would, who would actually follow? If a person was, was set up out here across the street and they had a little booth set up and they had a stone and they had a hat and they put the stone in the hat and they look in the hat at the stone and they tell you, this is what I see. Now this is what he did. And this is what, would you believe that person? Would you actually go and follow that person? You'd look at that person as, as a pretty odd fellow. I mean, just a few years ago, not that many years ago, and I hope none of you were really a part of this, but not too many years ago, people in the United States, of course, they say we'll fall for anything, but you remember some years ago, people used to actually buy rocks, pet rocks. And I know that probably some of you, when you saw, when you, when you went on, on, on the checkout, uh, checkout stand, you saw people with rocks in their hand, you probably, you know, peeled your eyes, looked at them a little odd, like this is pretty odd. Fella. Who buys a rock? takes it home, takes care of it, makes sure it has a nice place to sleep. But this is the kind of person that we see with Joseph Smith. He, he, his family was odd. They had superstitious beliefs. They, they, they couldn't, the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree. His father was sort of like that. I think when Joseph himself fell, he got bruised a little bit because he's even more odd than his father. 
And they, they were involved in these things called religious folk magic, which was a common practice at that time. They all saw visions. And so he believed that God communicated directly with him. So many other people do. You got Mac Deaver down that, down that trail now. He believed, God, he believed God communicated directly with him. He's 15 years old. He gets his first vision. God told him that his sins were... Now, imagine if this could happen to you. 15 years old, he gets a vision. God told him his sins were forgiven and that everybody else was false. All the other churches were false. He was the one that was going, and this is the, rest, the idea of the restored church, the idea of the, the Mormons, the Latter-day Saints. This is the restored church. This is the true church, according to Joseph Smith, because he had a vision that everyone else was wrong. And so he, he became known during this time, he's, he's called a glass looker, a, a peep stone a looker, a stove top uh, hat, a little, I guess they call them topper hats. And this is where the beginning of this organization is. So uh, at some point, he, he's told by the, the angel, he goes up in this place not far from his home. He, he, keep, he keeps getting these messages from the angel about, about these golden plates. And he keeps, he keeps inquiring about this. And of course, the, the golden plates uh, lead him to some silver spectacles with, with some more stones. And he looks, he, he gets those and he sees again. And he says, and this is the revelation. This is the beginning of a group of believers. This is how these things start. You talk about how false teaching starts. You can't, you can't tell a better story than this one. Not only that, I mean, and because we just don't have time to go through everything in his life, he gets involved with polygamy. And of course, uh, he and uh, numerous other of the, of, the, of the Mormons, and the problem there, of course, is twofold. One, because of what they began to teach at one point, that you can only have one wife, and then with the switch to where you can have many wives. I want to read some of those uh, quotations just so you can see how odd, how odd this organization is. I think this is why some, in, even in the political climate today, says these people cannot be classified or categorized as Christian by any standard. Obviously, they're not members of the body of Christ, but I mean, even in the, in the denominational world, they are seen as odd. One of the, one of the comments here from the book of, their book of Jacob, from the book of Mormon, Jacob 2.27, Wherefore, my brethren, hear me, hearken to the word of the Lord, for there shall not any man among you have save it be one wife, and concubines he shall have none. So you get a clear meaning there. But then over in the docu uh, Doctrines and Covenants, which is a, a, one of the four different books that sort of govern their system of beliefs, it says, David also received many wives and concubines, and also Solomon and Moses my servants, also many other of my servants from the beginning of creation until this time. And in nothing did they sin, save in those things which they received not of me. And another uh, section of that uh, doctrine and covenants. And if he have ten virgins given unto him by this law, he cannot commit adultery. For they belong to him, and they are given to him. Therefore, he is justified. Now, those latter two statements obviously are contradictory to the first. And this is a pattern throughout the various writing or revelations that we see in the Mormon faith. You see where in one part of a book it, it will say one thing, baptism is not for the remission of sin, and then a few, a few chapters, you use the term chapters down in the same book, it says baptism is for the remission of sin. And you ask yourself, how can people who are supposed to uh, seem to be intelligent, seem to be sincere, how do they come to terms with these things? Now, you have to assume that they are aware of these different laws. You have to assume that they, they've read these things. You have, to assume, you have to assume that they know something about what it is that they believe, or uh, at least to some degree. But when we look at, at this is the man who started this religion, 
a man who was run from, from town to town because of bank fraud, a person who was, who was run from state to state because of the practices of that religion at that particular time. So uh, about uh, in the 1820s, he, he writes out, he gets these stones, and he finds, he, he finds the translation, and, and he writes out the new, the new real translation of what the Bible is supposed to be. It's been corrupted. And so he writes it out. It's the Book of Mormon. And they start and they have a little, they have a little church in New York. You have to ask, what, what kind of person has thoughts like that? I, I want to read something else that was, that was a part of his, his a comment that he made in his own words. And I want you to hear this. He says, I combat the errors of ages. This is a, an arrogance that goes beyond that that we even see in the brotherhood today. I combat the error of ages. I meet the violence of mobs. I cope with illegal proceedings from executive authority. I cut the Gordian knot of powers. I solve mathematical problems of universities. And God is my right hand man. God made Aaron to be the mouthpiece for the children of Israel. And he will make me be God to you in his stead. And the elders to be mouth for me. And if you don't like it, you must lump it. And can you, can you imagine that? That he has the audacity to put those words down? If you don't like it, and who even says that anymore? If you don't like it, you must lump it. I shall always beat them. I have more to, and, and, and this, it gets worse. I have more to boast. I have more to boast of than any man hid. I am the only man that has ever been able to keep a whole church together since the days of Adam. Neither Paul, John, Peter, nor Jesus ever did it. I boast that no man ever did such a work as I. The followers of Jesus ran away from him, but the Latter-day Saints never ran away from me yet. Would to God, brethren, I could tell you who I am. Would to God I could tell you what I know. But you would call it blasphemy. Absolutely. This is the man that people are following. And what person in his, right man, in his right mind could have such thoughts, much less allow other people to know them? His mental condition has to be questioned. I mean, you, uh, David said you don't want to say things that are, that are mean. But if a person has such a high estimation of himself in comparison to the most holy God, what else could you say about him? Going back to the time he was 15, going back to the time he was 15 years old, he's troubled by all this religious division. He can't, he can't understand it, the different revivals that are play, taking place in the New York area. He's troubled by it, and this is what causes him to ask God for guidance, to ask God for wisdom. It goes back to James 1 and 5, and he, he wants to know what is it that's, that's taking place and then he feels, the angel tells him that, that his future importance is going to be in what he translates from these stones, the fullness of the everlasting gospel that had been delivered by the Savior to the ancient inhabitants. He was told about the stones, and they were to enable him with a miraculous ability to translate the plates into English. So this is, this is how it begins. Now, of course, after he um, leads a number of people into this, this now group, the uh, first Book of Mormon goes on sale in New York in 1830. 
New York bookstore just down, just, you know, down to, not too far from where he was staying at the time. And they called themselves, actually called themselves from the, at the very onset, they called themselves the Church of Christ. A few years later, he said the angel Moroni came back to him. Of course, now this is, I hate to say this, laughable, but the, the angel told him that he needed the plates back. Didn't, he couldn't keep the plates, couldn't leave evidence of the plates being there. He had to get the plates back. It got almost like the Jehovah Witnesses saying that Jesus came to Brooklyn in 1906. So he, he gets a, a group of witnesses, supposedly witnesses. They sign this document saying that they had seen, they had seen these plates. Of course, all of this information is, is disputed by historians all over the place. He has violated almost every scripture that you can imagine. Certainly, he has, he has violated everything from Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. He's violated Jude 3, contend for the faith, once delivered to the saints. Because now he has received the revelation from God himself. Yes, how, how does a religion like this, how does a false religion like this, you can almost see how some groups continue to manifest themselves, how, how they uh, metamorphosize and expand and, and take on certain things, but how does this group with so much that is false continue to grow? That, that's a question, and you think uh, Hosea 4.6, uh, people destroy for lack of knowledge, but, but you go back then to their... To their uh, publications of their writings, documents, uh, Doctrine and Covenants. And it says, the Doctrine and Covenants, a collection of divine revelation and inspired declarations given for the establishment and regulation of the kingdom of God on the earth in the last days. Uh, there are so many contradictory statements in these Doctrines and Covenants. We can't, we can't begin to cover them all. Uh, and I just touch on maybe a, maybe a few, but it's one of four groups. The Book of Mormon, the Articles of Faith, Doctrine and Covenants, and Pearl of Great Price. These are all collectively uh, the books that represent the body of knowledge for the Mormon belief system. And so we, we, look, at, we look into these and, and we see a number of, of errors. I'll just point, there are a number of them in the book. I don't want to try to go through all of them right now. But, but they have preserved these, and, and they, even with the contradictions in them, they still continue to move forward. You have to, how does this happen? I, I am thankful to David that he, in, in the book, because we're going to use some of these things for some classes in San Mateo, the way that it, we show what the church is, and then you show what these denominations teach and believe. You see what the church is based on, you see what these denominations uh, teach and believe. You see what's true, you see what's false. As Buddy said, you see what's real, you see what's counterfeit. But they say, in one part, baptism is, is not for the remission of sins, in, the, in do, uh, Doctrine and Covenants uh, 2037, and then they say it is for the remission of sins, and uh, Chapter 84, verse 70 uh, and 74. All of these things, you look through it, it's amazing. I was, I was just amazed at how much is in there that doesn't make sense. And I think that's the, I think that's the hardest part um, for anyone trying to work with these people. And if you, and I was, someone said they had met with some people who were Mormons. You sit down, you try to, you ask them, you ask them, well, if I listen to Jesus Christ, will I be saved? John 12, 48. If I listen to the words of Jesus, will I be saved? Most of the time they'll say yes, but you say, then why do I need Joseph Smith? They don't have an answer. I mean, there's so many things that you look in, you, and you, they, the idea of God, they, they believe there's a Father, Son, but no Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is really sort of the mind of the Father and the Son. The idea of God being like man and man being like God. All, all these ideas of this some sort of transformative nature, you become like God and God becomes like man. Uh, it, it's one of, the, it's one of these, these things where you look and say, how does, how does this go side by side with the Bible? And you look and, and you have the, the Lord God, the idea of the prophet. You say, here's a false prophet. And, and of course, in the book of, book of Deuteronomy, you see what... what what determines whether a person is a false prophet or not. And of course, Joseph Smith fits that category. The things that he said will be true will not, have not come to pass. As a matter of fact, and I'm not sure, uh, I don't remember exactly the, the source of this, 
where he talked about people being on the moon. And he said, there are people on the moon. And he described these people. He says they're a thousand years old. They're six feet tall. I think that we had some people go to the moon. But they didn't see any of these people. They didn't see any of Joseph Smith's people, the people he was talking about. The primary problem with the Mormons, it's, it's simple. Their founder and their current leaders do not believe in, they do not respect the word of God. They have said the Bible is a corrupt document. It is, it is on, it, it, here's a, <clears throat> a comment that was made. It says, what shall we say then concerning the Bible? What shall we say then concerning the Bible being a sufficient guide? Can we rely upon the present corrupted state as being a faithful record of God's word? We all know that but a few inspired writings have descended our times. Who knows that even one verse of the whole Bible has escaped pollution so as to convey the same sense now that it did in the original? So you understand that they have no respect for the word of God. But they do have respect for the musings of a person who looks at a stone inside a hat. So they'll believe that, but they won't believe the, the Holy Divine Writ as it was passed, as it was revealed to us, the mind of God given to us. Again, you ask, you ask what these people think. The eighth article of faith, this is what it says here. We believe the Bible to be the word of God as far as it is translated correctly, which means by Joseph Smith. As far as Joseph Smith translates it, that's what we believe. We also believe that the Book of Mormon is the Word of God. If there's one thing that we can learn from all of these denominational groups is just how far they, they, they veer off the right path. Some of them even more uh, astonishingly than others, as we said, uh, the earlier ones that we're talking, the Lutherans and so forth, you can see how these people become, you can see how they move in the area. The Catholic Church, you can see how it moves in the area. Uh, the, the Pentecostals, the Methodists, all these groups, how do they move in the area? You can see it. Even, even within the church in, in the last 30, 40 years, when you, see, when you look at the crossroads movement, you can see how these people divert off the path. There is no reasonable uh, assessment that can be made to explain how people follow the Mormon faith. And, and that is the most, uh, perhaps, uh, to my mind, damaging assessment one can make. There is no sense to it. Certain things you can understand why people follow it, maybe their family, but there's just no sense to it. People need to know how the Mormons approach the biblical truth because whatever they pretend to believe cannot line up or find authority in the scriptures. It has to be manufactured through their modern day revelations to comply with their ever changing doctrine. Gifts of the Spirit include revelation, faith, the power to heal and to be healed, visions, speaking in and interpreting tongues and prophecy. They also believe in modern day miracles. This is an area where the Bible speaks clearly, though for Mormons that matters little. Still, one must look at this from the biblical perspective since the origins of Mormonism are from the scriptures as Smith knew and interpreted them. He is, after all, the prophet in their terms who heard the word of God, received inspiration. The fact of the matter is that miracles have ceased. And this is the one more example of the sham of Mormonism that the Latter-day Saints and that Jesus himself commissioned the apostles to go into all the world and preach the gospel. The difference between what we have in a false prophet and false religion, and, and others will be in the part of the lectureship later, the Jehovah Witness, the Assembly of God, all these different groups started by people, started by men and some by women. And we ask ourselves, what is it that we can do? How can we reach these people? I think that, that comes down to the fundamental question. How do we reach people who have belief, belief systems like this? What can we do? How can we bring them back to the scriptures? How can we bring them to understand the respect and the authority of the scriptures? How can we establish the authority of the scriptures for them in a way that they will throw off this error? 
that they will get rid of these belief systems. They can once again, with a fresh mind, with clear mind, see what God has in store for them. So they can see that Jesus, who came, became uh, the word becoming flesh, died on the cross, that they have the hope of eternal salvation, the forgiveness of sin. That's not just looking at their error, not just identifying their error, not just seeing how they're on the, on, off the right path, but how can we, through the information that we have about them, how can we help teach them? How can we bring them to the Lord? How can we impress upon them the importance of eternal salvation? Not, not the belief systems that they have, but the, but the belief system we find in the scriptures. That's what we really want to do. I, I, I think that's probably not speaking for David. He can speak for himself. But I think that at, at the heart of it, this is part of what this book's about. The, this is what so many people believe that's false, that's counterfeit. This is what, they, this is what so much of America believes. How can we, the body of Christ, those who believe in the inspiration of the, of the, of the, of the scriptures, how can we bring them to the house of God. You know, Jesus told the apostles that the Spirit would guide them into all truth. All things pertaining to life and godliness are found in the Bible. Everything that we need to know is found in the Scriptures. And so what we have is a responsibility, obligation. Take this Word of God. Try to help and, and teach these people. When they come to your door, don't shun them. Don't, don't, don't push them away. Don't tell them, I don't have time. If they come to the door, ask them to come in. Ask them to sit down. Ask them when you can have a Bible study. You say, well, we've tried that before. It hasn't been successful. Well, maybe not every time, but sometimes it will be. You know, when we were over in, in England this past, um, this past fall, in last year, and the lecture series was on uh, Islam from a Christian perspective, one of the things we found out, and I really didn't expect this, was that uh, a woman who had been a Muslim became a Christian. Now, she put her life on the line, really, right there. But this, this is the kind of thing that can happen. Hard work. This is the kind of thing that can happen when we, when we have the information to impart. This is the kind of thing that can happen when we, when we take uh, seriously our responsibility to teach. Not just point out error. We do want to point out error, but to teach. And I don't think it's, I don't think it's really uh, beyond the, the spectrum that we can actually convert some of these people, convert some Jehovah Witnesses, convert some Mormons, convert some of these people. Sometimes we think of it as too hard a task. But this, when we look at how this began, it's easy, and the thing about this is it's easy to point out the errors. And I think that anyone who's sincere, anyone who's honest, if you point those errors out, even we would do this. If we, had, if we had a certain belief and someone came to you or I and they said, this is what you believe, but this is what the Bible says. That if we're honest, if we're sincere, we'll go with what the Bible says. And this is what we must try with these people, to show them the error of their ways, to show them the contradictions, to show them the, the improbability of their beginnings, to show them the way to salvation. We appreciate, Brother Johnny, that good lesson. I appreciate you emphasizing the caliber of character this man was. That's not sometimes given a lot of attention. Uh, years ago, I studied under Brother James D. Bales and took his class on cults. And Brother Bales, uh, in the 1940s, while he was working on his doctorate at the University of California um, at Berkeley, was very much involved with Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons, especially the Mormons. And he had a lot of writing. And he, 
he could quote from the Book of Mormon, Pearl of Great Price, Doctrines and Covenants, which are the two ones that they actually get their more their doctrine from, the Book of Mormon. He could quote from it just like we would quote from the Bible. And uh, very interesting to hear him teach on this, but he gave us one day his perspective of the caliber person that uh, Joseph Smith was. He said, I think he was just a charlatan and invented this stuff just to see how gullible people would be and what he could do because he knew he could bilk them out of about anything. And that's, that's about, about right. That that's exactly, and they don't know that. Of course, sometimes you move, you know, 150, nearly 200 years later and they run for president. And you know, if they got a hat, the rock in it, they can solve all things. So, uh, but I don't think people even consider that. Let me link this up because really it links itself. The only real difference between Joseph Smith and Muhammad is culture, language, and the years separating them. They both did exactly the same thing. Not one whit different. The Quran is that day's Book of Mormon. And they don't realize, people don't realize that. First thing anybody must do, what the devil must do to get people to sin, to get them away from God, to capture them, is to do just that, get them away from the Word of God. And what better way than to come up with a latter-day revelation? Brother Keeble called these folks too late day saints. And I think it's right. It's exactly correct. I don't know why Johnny wanted to complain about this. Uh, we had a lectureship and produced a book on the Book of Mormon a number of years ago. You had a big step up. Most people, you had a whole book there to help you. But again, maybe that's the reason we did choose you to do that when you know that some people need as much help as they can get. <laughs> I know, let it go, let it go.